Hello, welcome to the Total Clarity Podcast. I'm Jesse Hyatt. And I'm Mike Varley, and this is week 35 of our 52-week walk around New York City. Yeah, it's week 35, and this week we walked about the theme, hip-hop in Queens. That's right. This is a theme that we've been thinking about for a long time now, thinking the best way to prepare for it. And we did a couple of different things. For starters, uh, we took a look at some of the most historically successful and contemporary artists that came from the borough of Queens and just did a dip, deep dive researching, listening uh, in the weeks leading up to this walk. Yeah, yeah, it's been really nice to both hear music that I've never heard before and re-listen to music that I have heard before, but with this new set of eyes and ears for the borough of Queens and the city in general and with the idea that I know I'm going to be really focusing on it, not just listening to it for the enjoyment of listening to music, but also listening to the lyrics a bit more and thinking about how it interacts with the rest of the city. Yeah. So you'll be seeing uh, footage on top of our interview, which we'll talk about in a second, from five different neighborhoods. It is Queensbridge, Corona, Jamaica, Hollis, and St. Albans. And that's home to a number of different artists. Uh, we'll throw down in the description all the artists that we were kind of keyed in on this week. But, you know, Nas, uh, you know, 50 Cent, Nicki Minaj, A Tribe Called Quest, Run DMC, uh, Juice Crew, Organized Confusion. Uh, the list goes on. You'll see down below uh, what we were drawing from. And you'll hear us talk a little bit about it here and there in our interview with our guest. Yeah, our wonderful guest this week was Miss Marr, who is a hip hop artist that lives in Queens, that grew up in the city between Queens and the Bronx and back in Queens. And she's amazing. She has a 12 year music career already at a as a young woman and we had a really great conversation. We had a nice walk in Queensbridge Park and up north a bit to Rainy Park and walked and talked and heard about what it was like to grow up in Queens, heard about what it was like to get started with music. And, you know, if you keep listening, you'll hear all the details yourself. That's right. So a couple of shout outs before we get into it. First shout out is to our friend, and MC Mike Berger, aka Mike Baya, who gave us the connection to Miss Marr, uh, which was a fantastic one. So thank you for that, Mike. Yeah, and second shout out to Sam Sellers, aka Rabbi Darkside, who is a hip hop educator and MC. And we were able to have a nice hour long conversation. And I got to learn a lot about the history of hip hop in Queens from him and he recommended a whole bunch of stuff for me to listen to, watch, and yeah, great to get some information from him. And we'll put a link down below for both uh, Sam Sellers and Mike Berger's music and information. So That's right. Listen to that too. Yeah, lots down in the description this yeah, week. Yeah, it's going to be a crowded description. <laughs> yeah, but without further ado, let's get into our talk with the fantastic Miss Marr. All right, Miss Moore, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to have you on here. Thanks for having me. It's yeah, a totally. Pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're excited to go through this walk through the Queensbridge area with you and talk a little bit about your life and your career. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, to get started, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about your Queens experience, you know, growing up in the borough? Queens experience. Yeah. First of all, I rub Queens to the fullest. I don't know if you see the New York City headband, yeah. but I'm such a New York girl. <laughs> i grown up in Queens all my life. I started off in Corona, Queens, to be specific, by like 104th Street and 39th Ave. Shout out to Corona. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also went to the Bronx afterwards. So I was in Corona until I was like 12. Uh, we left in September. I remember that date because I wrote it on the wall. Very dramatically, I wrote it on the wall of the old apartment that I used to live in. Oh, wow. There. 
And I took a picture and I was like, I'm never going to forget this place. Oh my gosh. Um, but, you know, we left, ended up in the Bronx and then came back to Queens, which is where we are now, Queens Bridge. Um, it's kind of, the story of how we ended up here is technically because we were getting evicted from our building out in the Bronx. And so my mom, she had filed for housing, you know, out here in Queensbridge years ago. I mean, I remember being like 13, like 12, going with her to the office uh, to make the application to sign up for housing. And, you know, years had already gone by. We had already lived in the Bronx and we never had gotten the call to move out here. But it just so happened to be that I think maybe a week before they told us that we had to get out, we ended up getting a phone call saying that you guys are able and are legible to come to live out here. So that's what we did. So we ended up out here kind of not really on purpose, but on purpose. And I just found it funny how coming here, I ended up in a place that signifies so much of what is the hip hop yeah. culture. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's walk yeah. over. <laughs> I feel like with a lot of these housing situations in New York, like it takes so long and it's years. not a great system that yeah. it takes so long to get people housing, but it sounds like it really was almost like magical timing for it, you. It was a very, it, it, I don't know, I just, I don't know. I don't want to say irony. I don't believe really in coincidences. I don't believe in luck. I think that things just happen. I believe in destiny and I think that you know, the apartment that we are at was most definitely, absolutely meant for our family. You know, we were meant to live there and, you know, I was meant to be out here and to kind of just see the perspective of the world through the lens of like Queensbridge. Um, because, you know, I had already been through Corona. I had already been through the Bronx. These are already different areas of like hip hop. And, you know, in yeah. the Bronx, that's basically yeah. what hip hop is considered to be yeah, like yeah. birthed. Yeah. And so to end up here in Queensbridge where you have artists like Nas, it was like, okay. And, you know, if I look out through my window and I look straight down, you could see where Nas used to live. Wow. Yeah. You know? so yeah. it's just, it just kind of all plays a huge role with your mental and how you, you decide to, you know, take the route of how you want to do things musically. Yeah. So a lot of the things that I've heard in his music I've been able to experience through myself, you know, so there's a lot of things that I can relate to on a level of like his way of hip hop. You know? Right. And the things that he had experienced being in Queensburg. So, yeah. So uh, Nas being an influence, when did his music come into your life? Earlier, <laughs> later, middle? Earlier. Yeah. I would say I was like, huh. 13, 13 listening to Nas, Biggie, Tupac. I was a really big Tupac fan when I was oh, young. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I also used to listen to a lot of reggaeton music. Okay. So, okay. Like, Spanish music. And I think that Spanish music came first, like reggaeton, because my brother, he was such a huge fan. He still is, my older brother. Yeah. Such a huge fan of reggaeton music that kind of in a way has rap incorporated in you know in the way that they sing the music that they sing uh -huh. uh, but Nas did come around and that kind of style of music came around right after so I was probably 13 12 14 and was it individual songs or albums like was Illmatic like was, the first introduction it was individual or? Songs. okay yeah this was very much during the time where like YouTube was very fresh right. okay. and people were just uploading all this content and I was just searching up hip hop, hip hop type beats, yeah. like yeah. stealing beats off of you know YouTube oh, and like cool. converting them through MP3 files <laughs> and like trying to rap over them. Yeah. Yeah. What was your um, experience listening to it? Was it mostly like sitting at home on a computer looking it up on YouTube, or was it? Did you have like 
at that point, if YouTube was around, did you have like an iPod or was it like burning it onto a CD on your disc man? I'm just trying to like paint the picture so, of like 13 year old Miss Mar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the picture looked very much like iPod touch. Okay. Um, first generation headphones. I had those really big like Sony headphones cool. and they were black and like plastic and they cost me like 12 bucks. Oh man. But they were so <laughs> good and I held on to them until my college years. Oh cool. Yeah. Until they finally gave up on me which is fine. You know I can yeah. probably try and find them again. Maybe try and find <laughs> them. Uh, but it was mostly outside. Okay. Um, I did a lot of walking around growing up Yeah. and just doing it alone half of the time I just had my headphones plugged in yeah. and I'd kind of be walking the way that we are right now and just kind of looking around and getting lost in the city and sometimes I feel like I know New York by the back of my hand like uh -huh. I just I feel like I've reached every little corner in New York um, because I've always had my music and I've never really felt in danger mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. I've always been the type to be out in the streets like 12 a.m. 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. With my headphones, With the on, headphones on, I always felt fine, you know? Yeah. And it didn't matter what neighborhood I was in. I always felt like there was something protecting me. And I think it was just having that, the music in your ears mm. just kind of gives you this leeway and this confidence into believing that like nothing can happen. Like the world, this world is your world. That's how it felt, you know? It like, creates like a soundtrack for yes. your life. And it's like all like, like all eyes are on you, but also nothing's gonna touch you because you're like making the move. Absolutely, it feels like I'm the main character and you're just all in it. <laughs> you totally. know? I yeah. definitely um, know that that's feeling. That's just what it felt like. Um, another thing is too though, like because I moved from place to place, mm -hmm. um, I was still going to middle school in Queens when I was living in the Bronx. Oh wow, so, so it was a long commute. Yeah, it train. was a long commute, and I would take the train. We had pitched the idea to the deans and the principals, and I was like, "Look, this is my last year in middle school. I was a, I was gonna be an eighth grader, and I was like, but I really don't want to change schools just for one year. Like, I can do it." And you know, they ended up agreeing. They gave me a metro card. Wow! And so from 12 years old, I started taking the trains from the Bronx out to Queens, and my mom, she would work, and you know, she still does. But at that time, she would work really late or sometimes, you know, she just got tired. Yeah. So I just roam around. Yeah. And no one would really give me shit for it, you know? Like, no one really bothered me about it. I just kind of did my own thing. Yeah. And that's how I would just explore everything, right? And that's where the headphones would come in. And that's really me, hands in my pockets, walking around. <laughs> um, Very, like independent it sounds like from a young age and I had to yeah it's cool that you were able to like speak up for yourself and tell your school what you wanted and yeah. I'm curious if any part of wanting to stay at that school like were you already making music and did you have friends at school that you were inspired by or making music with or or is there more to that story so, am i leading a little bit <laughs> no, well, you're not you're not leading but i think you're going into a good segue because i wasn't necessarily telling everyone that i was making music at the time but i would hint it mm. you know like i just kind of sneak it in there because i wasn't really the cool kid okay i was kind of really like i wasn't a loner either like i knew the kids that were like popular and stuff but I myself wasn't really considered popular. Um, so I would sit with them, but was I really sitting with them? Mm. Like, were they really having conversation, interaction with me? Um, not always, especially not when they were in groups. So it was really hard for me to even like let them know, like, hey guys, this is something that I do because I just didn't feel comfortable telling them. Right. But in that last year when I did pitch the idea of me staying or whatever. I came out with my first song. I went to the studio for the first time ever and I was so proud of it that I wanted to share it. And so I did, you know, I told my friends, I, I remember bringing in my iPod and just putting it in their ears and just being like, what do you think? And they didn't know that it was me. Oh my gosh. So, you know, just to let them hear and they're like, oh, this is cool, like who is this? And then after they kept hearing it, they realized that it was my voice and they were like, oh, this is pretty good. But it never really went 
beyond that. It was never like, oh my gosh, you could like really do something with this. And I think part of it is because we were so young. Right. You know, we're in middle school. So like everything just kind of felt like almost like a game, you know, things just come and they go and boys and girls. And that's really what everyone's main focus was out there, at least in my opinion. I went to IS5, by the way, which okay. is like right by Queen Center Mall. And I do remember though, as the year progressed, and the year was coming to an end like for me to stop being in that school there was one time where the dean i don't remember how she found out and i don't remember her name for some reason like my brain is just blocking it out but there was one point where the cafeteria was having like a free day and she was like we should have michelle performing like we should have michelle singing and at that point people mostly knew me just for like singing okay so in a way, rapping came, became the first thing that I did, but rapping was the thing that I did the most. So like people kind of always gave me this, I don't wanna, I don't wanna use the word stereotype just yet, but it, it's kind of when it started to get instilled where people, when they associated me to music, like even that teacher at the time, right? That Dean at the time in the cafeteria, it was mostly like singing until they knew that what I did was actually rap. Yeah. Right. So what did you do for that? I didn't thing end up doing did you, it. Oh, you didn't end up doing it? No, okay. oh, I didn't man. end up doing it that day. I don't, I don't remember why, I guess, I guess it just didn't happen. Like I remember her giving me the mic yeah. and I was just like, no, thank you. Oh, mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. But, yeah. All right, so I have a question about the uh, recording. Your first session, like, uh, t describe us a little bit that. Was it exciting? Was it scary? Like, what was it like to get to, like, do the first recording? Oh, well, my first session at the studio, I remember very clearly because I had an epiphany. Ooh. I remember just having a really big epiphany that day. So I went in because, like I mentioned, I was doing singing. Yeah. You know, I was doing a lot more singing than I was rapping just yet. Right. Um, no one really knew much about my rapping, only I did. Yeah. But the singing was something that people knew about. Like, you know, she sings, she could sing. So I remember one time, again, MySpace days, I met <laughs> this friend of mine that he was rapping at the time and he was looking for someone to sing on one of his songs that he was gonna release. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, hey, like I can do it. And he was like, okay, well, like you have to audition. <laughs> like you have to, uh, <laughs> we were really young too. Yeah. You have to audition. Like you, I have to hey, hear your voice. Thank you, it's serious. Yeah. Know? And I was like, okay, I guess like I could do it. And I remember meeting with him on Junction Boulevard out here in Queens yeah. and having him, you know, meet me up at his friend's house and was like, okay, we're gonna go to the balcony. It was a really, pretty much a really nice day. And we went inside the apartment of his friends and then we sat on the balcony where I could do like two hours. <laughs> and I did not sing. Oh, I couldn't sing. It wouldn't come out. Oh, oh my no. gosh, like, were you I, trying? I, no, I just, I don't. You just got nervous. I just kind of froze. Like I was like, oh, like, oh no, like, oh, oh no. no. <laughs> And in my head, I was just like, like, I'll sing, just give me a second. Next thing you knew, like two hours had oh passed by. Gosh. I still hadn't sing. And then I finally did it. Okay. I did it. He loved it. He's like, oh my gosh, you're so great. Ah. Uh. I was like, perfect. So eventually he books a, a session to the studio and what way? This way? This Let's way. Let's do this way. Right. <laughs> he books a session to the studio and we show up. Uh -huh. The studio is located by like Whitestone, I think. Okay. okay. Like Flushing Whitestone. You know, the okay. funny thing is I never really knew exactly how to get there by myself. Uh -huh. Just because the person that runs the studio, like the engineer, yeah, he would always pick us up. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Yeah, because we were younger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we weren't like, well, I was taking buses and yeah. trains and all that, but he right. wasn't yet mm. uh, the person that was taking me. Yeah. So we go inside. It's just like, it's almost like any little 
how do you say factory that you go into and mm -hmm. the walls are really blank but the okay. but they're kind of narrow and there's different rooms which are different little studios in between okay so we end up in this one room pretty small rectangular and then when you walk in the first thing you see is like the the equipment and then to the far left side you see like the little booth and you see the studio foam and it has a little door and i remember just sitting on like these little ottoman looking couches and was like okay like we're here in my head <laughs> and so then the person that i was with uh, was like okay well we're gonna get started and so we did i recorded my part of the song which was the hook okay and it was great right it was great <laughs> uh it was basically a remix to a mary j blosh song okay. mm -hmm. and i was doing the hook and he was rapping over it yeah but i say it was just great because at the moment that's all it felt it was just great mm. like it was okay this, that was great right thumbs up but then he started rapping yeah he got onto the booth and he started rapping and i had already finished my verse of the singing part and i was just watching him through the booth because you know there's like a little mirror right. and a little window and you could see through them and you could also hear the audio through the background you know because uh -huh. the speakers for the engineer that's working so i was listening to him and that's when my epiphany hit <laughs> and i was looking at him so deeply and i was like I could rap better than him. Oh. <laughs> and it was like, it was just, it was so funny because I said it to myself, you know? Right. So that thought was like engraved in my head. Yeah. But he never knew about it. I mean, he's probably going to know about it now. Sure. Are you still friends? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, just to interrupt for a second, I mean, that's almost like such an essential hip hop element too, oh, which is like, yeah. you know, like, You're oh, right. I can do this and I can do this better than you. You're you right. Know? And that's such a, just like in general too, it's such a like way to get inspired into doing something, like feeling your own potential, seeing Absolutely. someone do something well and being like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you think you did it, but you didn't have it quite. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly how it felt. And that, that night I went home and I wrote a song. Wow. Oh, yeah. nice. And, and then is that the song you recorded? It wasn't. So the okay. song that I had recorded was, again, like I mentioned, it was a Mary J. Blige remix that we had done. But then afterwards, I did my own song, yeah. which was called Wish Upon a Star. Okay. And that was the first song I had ever done that I had, like, fully wrapped in. And the vocals were me on the yeah. hook. And... It wasn't anything special, but it was definitely something that I think for my age was so ahead of its time. Nice. Yes. Yeah. And then I came out with another song called Seven to Four. Okay. And because that studio that I went to for the first time wasn't really like my studio, you know, I didn't, I wasn't affiliated to the engineer. He okay. was. He was the one that took me. So it wasn't like I could be like, hey, can I come back? Yeah. Um, because I hadn't made that connection just yet. So I ended up in someone's house in their closet <laughs> where they had this really like, it wasn't the best setup, let's be honest. <laughs> but it was just the mic, very narrow closet. Thank goodness I'm skinny and yeah. small. <laughs> and there I was like, hey man, I really want to record this song. The dude didn't charge me or anything. He was like, okay, like you could you could do your thing because he was also right. making music. Okay. Um, and that's just where he recorded was just in yeah, his house. Yeah, in his house. Cool. And so I did it. I recorded seven to four. It was a whole thing, which brings me to a different topic that kind of goes in between, which reminds me, which is so funny how things work. When I did seven to four and I finished recording, I remember him and I sitting down on his bed because you know, it was all in his room. Yeah. Very small too, like rectangular, pretty narrow. All you have room for is a bed, place for like your hamper and the closet okay. where you record. And I remember him sitting down with me saying, so Michelle, like you need a name. I was just gonna yeah. ask. I was just, cause you mentioned your teacher said Michelle Lee yeah. saying, I was gonna ask, when so, did that come up? Miss Mar wasn't a thing yet. Okay. So he was like, hey, you need a name. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I, I have a name. Like, right. my name's Michelle. <laughs> Did you not know I'm uh, Michelle? Right. <laughs> and so I was releasing music, like, um, 
Wish Upon a Star, that remix that I did, Seven to Four I released, uh -huh. just as Michelle Martinez. Okay. Nothing else. But in that conversation, he was like, hey, you know, you should do something funky. Like, I don't know, just like, I don't know. And I'm like, I, I really wouldn't know either. I don't know what to call myself. I don't know where to go about it or how to go about it. And I don't know if he had been brainstorming this from the moment that we met because that was my first time meeting him too. So I was really spontaneous too at that time. Like I said, I went out a lot. Yeah. Just roaming around the streets. I'd meet people all the time. And so he was someone that, it was the first time I was meeting him, first time I recorded music in his house. Like he knew nothing about me. I oh really gosh. didn't know too much about him either. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't know if he was thinking about this in the process of us meeting, but he was like, you should call yourself Miss Mar. Oh. And I was like, I didn't like it. Oh. Huh. I didn't like it at the time. Like, yeah. at the time I was just like, I guess I wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, I don't know, I guess. Yeah. Like, I'll think about it. Did it feel like, like what, do you remember what you didn't like about it? Was it like, was it just uncomfortable or like unfamiliar? Or was it like, did it feel bad in any sort of way? I think it was just unfamiliar. Yeah. And I think unfamiliar in, in the way that I was so used to just being Michelle right. that I couldn't see myself yet as anything other than Michelle. Right. Um, so just the, I, it wasn't the name that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. It was just, I didn't like having another name. Right, like mm -hmm. as if you'd be, feel like you're playing a character or I something. I mean, in or, a way, yeah. it was just like, it was just, all I knew was Michelle, so just let me be Michelle. Right, <laughs> that makes um, sense. Right. That's really interesting because I, I think there are a lot of artists that feel the other way where they need the name to escape or to mm. like to represent themselves as a separate identity. So that's really compelling that it was the other way for you at first you had to come to it. Yeah. Yeah. So then what was it that made you, like did you just think about it a bit and then it switched and you wanted to go with Miss Mar? It took actually years wow. for me to decide to adapt that name. And it wasn't really because of him he technically he gave out the idea of the name yeah but the background behind why i decided to adopt the name is because eventually i started to come out again with more music and i came out with this freestyle thing on youtube that so this day i think it would have gone viral had i not deleted it Okay. okay. But it's, <laughs> it's just something that I didn't want to be represented as in the long run. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, everything that's on the internet, it lives forever. Right. It's true. And, and it so, can pop up at any point. Right. And, and yeah. so I was like, 10 years from now, is this what Michelle wants to be represented as? Mm. No. So I deleted it, even okay. though it was already like at 6,000 in a week. Wow. Yeah. And you know, at the time, that's a big deal because yeah. YouTube was kind of fresh. Yeah. yeah. Um, so wow, that's a lot of courage and like foresight and you know just like principles you yeah know? absolutely great. i didn't want to be known for that just just the fyi it was just very sexual and like yeah it, it's just what it just didn't make sense mm, yeah. for me and lyrically i still think it's insane i mean it was very well done yeah, yeah. but people are not going to see past that you uh -huh. know right. they're not going to see past the topic and so they won't be able to like fully engage in the lyrics and the flow mm. and everything that comes with it mm -hmm. so then i released a song illispita uh-huh and then i released a song called TikTok. okay uh -huh. life-changing yep. yeah um i also did oh let me backtrack a little i did a song called uh red dot remix uh -huh. which was the mac miller uh remix to what he had done red dot and i called it the drugs okay yep. that was the life changer after the second life changer uh -huh. <laughs> Um, what, was, what was so life-changing about that? Well, that's when I adopted the name, oh, Miss okay. Mar. Um, when I came out with Illispita and when I did that Red Dot music, I realized that because I was doing a remix to someone that has a name already, mm -hmm. it just felt like it just kind of, again, another epiphany where it was like, I need a name mm. and I didn't know what to call myself again 
But before I hadn't really thought about it, this time I was thinking about it. I knew that I wanted a name. I knew that I wanted something that would stand out, but something that would have meaning. Right. And so I kept battling with what, what could be a name, what could be a name. And the only name that kept popping up was Miss Mar. Yeah. And I kept rejecting it at the same time. I was like, oh, like this is the only name that's coming up, Miss Mar. But I also don't want to take it because this dude just gave it to me. You right. Know? right. I didn't want to just take a name because someone gave it to me. Right. So I was like, I'm going to come up with a meaning for the name. And when I come up with that meaning, then I'll adopt the name fully. Right. If I don't come up with it, then it's not meant to happen. It's not meant to be. It's not my destiny for it to be Miss Mar. Yeah. And so, what, so you figured out a meaning? Yes, I did. <laughs> and I think it had a lot to do with the time I was in and just the life that I was living where a song like TikTok emerges. I was just going through a lot mentally, emotionally, especially for like me just being a kid. Because mm-hmm. um, essentially that is what I was. I mean, I was a teenager, but still, yeah. you know, so yeah, much yeah. to learn. You're still a kid. Yeah. Uh, so... I thought about it, and so the meaning goes as follows. <laughs> Miss is very simple. Miss is M-I-S-S, which is just young, yeah. right? That's what you consider a person that is single, not married, Miss. Yeah. Very proper, but also metaphorical, young. Right. And then Mar. I was always being told like Mar reminds people of the planet Mars, you know, Ah. Mars. Uh And I'm like, how can I perhaps adapt that in a way that represents who I am? And the truth is Mars is a color that I really like red. Yeah. Right. I like red and blue, but I really like red. Um, And Mars is a place that's like so far away, but it's also so close to the earth. You know, if you think about it scientifically. It's attainable. Right. But at the same time, Mars once had life. Mm. And now it doesn't. But there's still water creeping up here and there. Yeah. You know? So there's always that theory and that myth that, like, maybe there will one day be life again in Mars. Right. Which I just think that very much speaks to, like, my surroundings and my life. I see a lot of people coming and going. Um, when you live in places like, you know, the places that I've lived, you see so many things that make you feel like life is lifeless, but then you're instantly reminded that, no, life is going and it's alive and mm. you are very much alive. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I wanted that to represent, you know, the idea that there's still life out there creeping, just like in planet Mars. And again, that color red comes up again because red represents so many things like love and hate and lust and blood and fire and it's just all these things that are so real and and so true to what life is and what life could also not be and like life after death and it's just i just wanted that to tie together and so that's what that reminds me of so mar you know mars the planet the color red and then it's also half of my name which is i i think the reason why the guy originally gave it to me because right. Michelle Martinez. So I think he just did that. But, you know, I also wanted to take that because it is, you know, some part of my name. But it's interesting that it's only a very short syllable of my name, which kind of leaves it at this like to be continued, mm. you know, because mm-hmm. there's still so much left. But I decided not to finish it all. So I guess as a whole, what it represents, just to backtrack a little, is Mars, planet, being unattainable, but also reachable and life and after death. And then the color that represents so many things. And then half of my name that is like to be continued. And then you join it together with Miss is me, Miss Mar, a young woman just trying to make it. Yeah. Just trying to reach Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And that's really what Miss Mar represents. That's great. Young and just trying to make it. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I love I, that. Yeah, there's, yeah, it's, it's, it's so compelling how you came about it too, and this way that I think a lot of, you know, when you describe it, I know it resonates with me where it's like sometimes people hang something on you, 
and it's kind of annoying, yeah. but it sticks mm-hmm. with you. <laughs> and then you got to work through that, and then you like end up owning it at the end, you know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that can relate to a lot of people. I think that can bring us kind of nicely into something we wanted to talk to you about, which is just the general idea of collaboration and community. Yeah. And how that shows up so much in hip hop in general. And I'm curious what your experience within that is. I mean, obviously, you know, this person kind of named you, but then you took it and, and made it your own and figured that out. And then it seems like you've worked with a number of different people on different tracks and in recording and, and whatnot. And I, I know it's kind of a general topic, but yeah. is there anything that you, uh, do you, do you think about community in making your music or do you think about making things individually? I think, a little bit about both right so when i'm like writing and making music or just creating or i'm sitting in a thoughtful space it's not really stemming from a place where it's like planned or anything you know it's very much like whatever happens happens Mm -hmm. and so regarding writing when i'm writing music i'm writing whatever is on my mind oftentimes that will have to do with my surroundings which has to do with community Mm -hmm. or sometimes it'll just have to do with myself and my thoughts and somehow that segues into community Mm -hmm. in terms of like actual collaborations when i think about it and you say it out loud like you ask out loud i actually don't feel like i've done as many collaborations as one probably could especially being in this industry where there's so much talent and there's so many people that are you know that it takes to create this this form of culture right Right. because hip-hop is a culture it's not just rap music it's rap music and dance and graffiti and it's all these things that make it so interesting that make hip-hop a culture it's the community itself but i i feel like sometimes it's a little hard to collaborate Uh with people because especially in new york i mean Mm. i don't know I, i haven't been to many places but like in the areas that i've grown up in and the people that i've met a lot of people are very on their like survival to the fittest And it's just me right like fuck everybody else and it's only me that can be at the top right and everyone's just kind of fighting for that gold medal at the top when the reality is there is no gold medal right right you know what i mean like there is nothing that is gonna assure you that spot of you are the one and only and the best there's no such thing there is no best there is no one and only there is how do you say no there is no real competition but yourself and i think that sometimes they will make you feel like you are in competition with other people and so that's what makes it really hard i think to collaborate with some people even though i've wanted to i mean for example i've had people that i've performed in the same venue with yeah and you know they'll do great or at least in my opinion, they'll do great and I'll reach out or mm-hmm. like, I'll give a follow, maybe not follow back. You know what I mean? And yeah. it just, it does a lot to the industry. And I think, I mean, sometimes I guess it's a little hurtful yeah. to the industry because then how do we create more spaces for artists like us if we won't even let each other into the same space? Yeah. And it is, I think what you're saying about like people thinking that there's the best of the best and there's like a goal there's this idea that there's scarcity yeah and I think I mean I think a lot of that has to do with like competition because we live in a capitalist society and they want us to think that yeah and there's not yeah at least not in this country like there's enough to go around absolutely and I think if we all like try to adopt that that idea that there's enough to go around and like if I share what I have with someone else like that's not going to take away from me Um, But I was thinking, I guess the most recent song that you put out 
I think of that as a collaboration. Um, and I don't know if that's how you think. The the one that references, it's a remix. Oh, so that one, okay. And I don't know if you yeah. think about it in that way. But, and I know, like, obviously. Loyalty and family? Yeah. Family and loyalty. Family, family and loyalty. loyalty. Yeah. <laughs> of course, like, J. Cole and Gangstar, like, aren't doing that with you. Yes. But I don't know. Like, from my perspective, they are. Yes. And I'm just curious how no, you think about I that. I think that you are 100% right. I feel like, first of all, if there would have been no original song, there would have been no reason for me to remix it. I wouldn't have anything to remix. And uh, the person that created the beat is DJ Premier, mm -hmm. which is in Gangstar, uh, in the group. And so... If and Nas he, Connection with right, Elmatic, right, based on that. Exactly. So, yes. Um, so had he not created that beat, right, or not even, had he not created the beats or just the music that he had created years ago, then we would not be in a place where I would feel so inspired to look for DJ Premier or Gangstar mm. songs still now. Mm -hmm. And I maybe would not have came across it. You know what I mean? So it takes steps to have gotten there. You know, I have to have first heard about him, mm -hmm. heard about them listen to the song then get inspired and you know the people behind the music have have had to have created first in order for me to get behind it next right and so yeah that is in itself a collaborative effort um because obviously you know premiere wasn't like hey mar this is for you <laughs> right but <laughs> let's pretend that he did way, <laughs> you know yeah um, and in a way like he did yeah you by know, just putting, just it, by out putting it out there exactly mm -hmm. and like it coming from like all the many different other types of music that came before like so much history of collaboration and even in hip-hop like sampling yeah. is such a major thing and like you know when you're putting something out I think I mean I'm not a hip-hop artist but I think that you know that like someone might hear this and might like pull a lyric from me Absolutely. or might like pull a beat from me or something like that I think it's done really often too in music you know where um, a very popular example is that line that Tupac says is, I ain't a killer, but don't push me. Like, mm. there's so many people that try to um, emulate that line and put it, you know, as their own. And even though he's deceased, it's still a form of collaboration because, you know, you had to have put it out there first for someone else to try and, you know, create it and make it their own. And sampling, yeah, of course, I guess it is always a collaborative effort, right? Because I'm working with, uh, producers that have that style of music that I, you know, just have that acquired taste for. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for them, obviously, then there would be no music, no melody for me to actually rap over. Right. Uh, so in that sense, yes, definitely a lot of collaboration in the sense of like maybe joining with people more often and actually getting into the studio with people. I've only ever done like three okay. collaborations like that. And, you know, I'm in a pretty long career span now. My resume is kind of long, I'd like to say. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I started yeah. at 12 and, you know, I'm 24 now. Mm -hmm. I turned 24 last year in yeah. December. Yeah. Happy late birthday. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been making music for half of your life yes. at this point. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And when you put it like that, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you still have so much more time and the more you do the more you know you're going to want to collaborate with people and they're going to want to collaborate with you mm -hmm. um i think this idea of competition it reminds me how i feel like a lot of your songs we've been talking about it you seem like you have such a positive attitude and a positive thing that you want to share yeah and I mean, we have said that that's what you're doing. Is that true? <laughs> is that your, or, or are we like reading into it too much or focusing only on a couple areas? Like it, it almost feels to me like you're, you hold the persona of like the hip hop artist and you like own some of the competitive stuff, but you're yeah. also pushing back against it in a way. I think that it's safe to say both, okay. right? Like. At the end of the day, it's hip hop, you yeah. know, so <laughs> it goes back to that epiphany that I had where it's like, I think I could do that better than you. And yeah. I did. Right. Yeah. Um, so that still stands very true within myself. Like for me, as of now, I 
would say that I think the rap industry right now is very much lacking lyrically, um, just originality and so many different things. I think that the industry is lacking and I think that I have that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I will wear my cap proudly <laughs> and I will say that I think that I am one of the illest. Um, artists out there and I would say rapper but I just I can't even consider myself just a rapper you know mm. because what I do is rap yeah uh -huh. what I am is a hip-hop artist yeah. right so I would say that I hold on to that little edge of competitiveness because I do think that in certain things I definitely come on top mm -hmm. um, some people may agree some people may disagree but to me I will always hold that thought right. very yeah. very close and I will always resonate with that idea because that's just how I feel yeah, yeah. Um, but there's also that part of me where it's like I know I'm not like I don't think that I'm better than anyone in terms of like just people yeah. you know I think that we're just all people at the end of the day and I don't think that I don't know someone deserves to get shot over a song mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah. so that's where i kind of hold back because again where i come from you see a lot of that yeah you know? there is um someone that's pretty known in the community out in queensbridge he goes by the name of king shooter uh -huh. and he passed away uh I don't, has it been a year already i don't even oh. know i didn't know him personally i've only encountered him once mm -hmm. and that was just kind of on the chinese by the chinese spot very randomly high and by kind of thing i didn't know who he was he didn't know who i was right um but i remember him telling me like oh you know i make music you don't know who i am i'm <laughs> like nope <laughs> and you know it, it was what it was but then i found out that he got shot and it was a really big deal i mean there's a pretty big mural out in queensbridge and why he got shot i'm not too familiar but there's always a lot of like just rap beef right. and just yeah. like beef in the hip-hop culture and yeah. like just being a shooter and yeah. like things like that that when i see that it makes me want to hold back in certain things because the the reality is that there's a very thin line between the fame and the celebrities and the things that we see and then there's real life and street shit yeah. right you know? right yeah. yeah that was yeah there's like several threads i want to follow up on but that <laughs> one uh it, it, most relevant right now is we were you know, we've been thinking a lot about hip hop and a lot about Queens hip hop specifically this week as we're walking around. And we were thinking about community and like how community is such an integral part of the hip hop experience and, and like the creation of art. And then there's, I, I don't know if I necessarily call it a flip side, but the idea of beefs or feuds is really something that you have, I guess on the one end of the spectrum, East Coast, West Coast, Biggie, Tupac, people killing themselves. It's real. And it's And it's real, yeah. yeah. And then on the other side, um, maybe of the spectrum, it's almost like um, like WWE wrestling, kind of like, you know, like I'm going to feud with somebody because it mutually brings us both up in the culture, gives us something to make, a, you know, a, a record about, a song about, a verse about. And... Uh, and that, but like, I th there's always that their danger that maybe you say something a little too much, and mm -hmm. then it escalates to this level, and it's like I don't know this conversation of realness and like mm. what what's important realness and what's like we don't need this realness in our lives, and uh, yeah, I guess I, I just being you know in the in the industry now for 12 years, I mean, what what is your general take on on like feuding and so like is it like you know, I don't touch that at all, or like I see the benefits. Like, where where do you stand? I think it's kind of corny. Yeah. I think mm. that um, when you reach a certain point in your career, there are so many people watching. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we're artists, and we're not here to like raise children and like raise the people around us. But the way that our minds work, just like even like scientifically you know when you think about it in that in that essence as we grow up we basically absorb things like a sponge yeah. yeah you know so whether you like it or not or whether you think it is true or not the people that are listening are listening and yeah. some people don't know when something is real and when something is fake and so that's when that vagueness of realness kind of gets blurred because now you have a bunch of people that can't tell if you're really beefing for real 
and then people are killing each other over really silly stuff yeah. right. you know what i mean so it's like i guess in a way the business has become entertainment you know rap has become very in you know just mainstream whereas mm -hmm. before it was really gangster rap and yeah. like trying to get out of poverty you know yeah, back yeah. in the 80s 90s yeah uh it it's kind of the the mood has shifted yeah into something more i guess party vibes into something that is a little bit just more mainstream you know mm -hmm. something that people want to have fun to and the message just kind of gets lost so in order to keep it entertaining people will you know create these feuds that in between themselves they know that isn't necessarily real but into the eyes of you know the people watching you can't tell what's real and what's fake, you know? Yeah. So I just feel like that shit is kind of corny to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's almost a waste of time, a waste of energy. I just, I, I don't have the time to be faking that yeah. we're not cool. Like, yeah. if right. we're not, we're not. Yeah. Right. Um, in terms of, like, just competition in general, um, or not even competition, just beef, right? Yeah. If it's real, it's real, you yeah. know? There is real beef out in the music right now i mean people have gotten shot you know lately there's um people like king vaughn we see things like six nine i mean these are people that i don't even really like saying their names right because the, i just don't feel like i have the energy to see to say these names to like let my vocal cords even allow mm, them to yeah. say these names because half of the time they're just doing things that make us fall into like this stereotype that hip-hop already has you know so it's like you're creating this beef or you really are beefing right? right so you're either making something that isn't true and then you make it believable or then there's that other part that is true and it is believable because it is true but at the end of the day what happens is that hip-hop becomes this the bad guy right hip-hop yeah. becomes the industry of music that only belongs to angry black hispanic children and then there's the people that follow along because they want to copy this lifestyle but they're not ready for what comes with the realness of yeah. it right yeah. and at the end of the day everyone is a real fully formed human Absolutely. that has like every part to them you know they have like a sensitive side they have an angry side like every single person has that but yeah i think um it's it's tough when it's like you're doing something for entertainment and you're doing something that maybe isn't quite real. I've I've been listening a lot to that podcast uh, Louder Than a Riot, which is about how uh, like lawyers, prosecution lawyers use hip hop artists lyrics against them in yeah. court all the time. Look at Bobby um, Shmurda. He went to jail for it. But, you know, he yeah. kind of did it to himself. But it's tricky because it's like, yeah, what like. In a lot of other industries, if right. you are just pretending or playing, like everybody sort of gets it right. that you're pretending and playing, and like gives you the benefit of the doubt Absolutely. that you have. Another... Or you're just releasing your your pain or your energy. Right, yeah. right. Or but, in the in the financial markets, people are allowed to manipulate on television, but like not if you're just like a single person. You know, right. it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the uh, I, I, did I interrupt? No, you? no, go ahead. The, uh, the idea of like positivity, I think uh, a synonym for that for me with respect to your music is like awareness too, is I think what you're speaking to. And it's like, uh, cause I know I like, I think positivity it, like weirdly can have a negative connotation cause it's like, like softness or something, but yeah, it's not yeah, that. Yeah. It's just kind of like, you know, a true understanding of self and the direction that you want to go in. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the songs like uh, like Half Full, Half Empty and uh, and Sun Kissed and, uh, and Action, which I really, I Action's love great. Action. Yeah, uh, I think Action yeah. is my uh, favorite song. Really? Yeah, it's yeah. great. But like uh, all of that, it just displays to me a, a sense of, you know, uh, both wanting to enrich others' lives and also an awareness of self where it's like, I'm going to put out things that are good about me and then have that energy come to me, you know? Absolutely. And, no, uh, I think you're touching a really um, important part where, like, from a very young age, I've been trying to incorporate in my career. And, you know, as you speak about it, and then I listen and then I kind of just have it all replaying in my head. It kind of makes sense. And 
it makes me happy to feel like I'm achieving that. So how how I mentioned that whole freestyle that I did when I was younger mm. and just deciding that I wanted to get rid of it because I didn't want that to represent me in the long run definitely has to do a lot with that like self-awareness with what I want to put out there and like what I want people to perceive of me you know because at the end of the day no matter where you are you're basically a little walking billboard you know (laughs) you are always walking and walking in a form of like who you are is what you see and what you put out there and you're just like you're a little walking resume (laughs) and people will you know check that off and see if you fit the criteria Mm -hmm. and in this life you build the life that you want to build and you also build the character that you want to build and I try to be very careful when I'm doing things so like if I'm doing something I'm doing it on purpose Mm -hmm. you know Um, everything I try to do with a purpose uh, for you know my own self-awareness but also for the awareness of like the people around me and the people that are listening yeah Um, you know I have siblings I have little brothers and they're boys you know Mm -hmm. Hispanic boys growing up in these kind of areas it's important to me to have them you know recognize real yeah um, real for what it is and then real in just the the real life world Um, but also to not get lost in this like in this hip-hop lifestyle that sometimes people try to sell you Mm -hmm. that isn't realistic yeah i mean blessings always come your way right you just gotta keep it you just (laughs) gotta keep it there yeah (laughs) just gotta keep in that mindset i mean sometimes it feels like uh you watch people that cheat and it feels like well i should cheat too because that's the way Mm -hmm. but it's like you just gotta keep on your path and like you know sometimes it takes longer but maybe that's the time that you needed to mature to be in that space too. yeah i agree i think that's where like i you know after i asked you that question about like competitiveness versus positivity i'm the way you answered it i feel like relates to what you're saying um it makes so much it's almost like positive like self-esteem and that can be used as combat like because i think yeah seeing somebody cheat you could be like well, I'm just going to cheat to be better because I want right. to win. Or but I the, get there the idea of like, yeah. I can do that. And I'm like, I can do that better. Like, that's almost like positive competition. Like, and it's competing with yourself and competing with like, how good can I get? Um, which I think is an amazing thing to like put out there as opposed to like the, I'm going to fight with everybody. Yeah. And, and just win and do yeah. anything to win. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it is right. It's one of those things that, when I look at, you know, the artists that we have mentioned earlier, like Nas, Pac, and Biggie, like, these are people that made it into the industry because they were talented, Mm -hmm. you know, nothing else, you Mm -hmm. know, everything, everything else came after, you know, the character, tough guy, flashy dressing when Diddy came in, you know, like, all of these things came after, but the base and the foundation of what got them to where, you know, they were was just their ability to do good at what they do and yeah. they were just good at making good music you know yeah. and then everything else came after now you mentioned like you know the the idea of cheating and stuff and like kind of you know working your way to the top and like what where are those um values i'd be lying if i said that sometimes i feel like i i'd be lying if i said that sometimes i don't feel like maybe I should do something different. Totally. Yeah, you know? I mean, totally. we all would, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, I think that's a human Absolutely. instinct. Absolutely, and it, and it gets hard, you know? Like, for example, in action, um, the first thing that I start off with is Spanish mommy in a big city, mm-hmm. but no one pay mine because, well, pretty, <laughs> with no titties, don't impress nobody, yeah, you yeah. know? And we live in a world where what is impressive as of now, considered impressive in the industry, especially with the females in the industry is just big ass titties you know what i mean like just this figure this figure of what a woman is supposed to look like and supposed to be like if she's trying to enter this industry yeah and it's like i am clearly not that like i am petite you know i'm just not that vibe you know that's just not the vibe like i'm sexy in ways that aren't 
sexual. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's there's sensual, but then that's not my main focus. You know, my main focus is I, I want to rap. You know, I yeah. like rapping. Like I love to do it. I'm good at it. I'm, mm-hmm. you know, it. There is no one out there I would say that does it the way that I do it. But it, it just sometimes feel like it feels like this, like this, everything right now, still uh-huh. quiet non non moving you know stagnant um it just feels like everything is kind of passing you by and like mm. when you like for example i look at this right now in the river and it's flowing but it's not going you know so it sometimes it feels like that and it makes you want to be like man screw this yeah. i'm about to go on the ground show a little bit of ass <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. and then that's when my morals come in and then that's when a little bit of like that 12 year old Michelle before she was even Miss Mar, the Michelle that decided I'm going to take that video down, the Michelle that decided like I'm going to make rap music that just comes naturally, um, comes into my head and is like, but you're, you're good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Your talent is good enough. And And I think that's actually like, it's a benefit to, I have a few different things I'm thinking like, I mean, you mentioned, you know, anything you put out there, other people are taking it in. And like, yeah, a lot of what we take in is like, you have to be this way. You have to be this perfect, like unattainable human that like you're born into the body you're born into, like make it you. Right. Like that's one thing. And then, so you're putting out like, this is me. And like, you don't have to be like, whatever yeah, that like already magazine done says they're doing it they're doing it well let yeah, them keep doing exactly. it well like no yes, wait. like all, all about it if that's what you're about but then the other thing is like if you start to like not be yourself and Absolutely. then you get big yeah. then you have to keep being that big going because that's not what yourself got you big in and the like first place. exactly Absolutely. and so if you just let it like flow and be you and something that makes you happy like even if you don't have all the clicks and the likes and the views and the money that comes with that or whatever like i don't know i think there's something to that i think you're doing yourself a service too Absolutely. by like holding on to your values and and doing what makes you feel good peace yeah. of mind yeah peace of mind goes a long way cuz once you have the fame and the money and all of that and the glory that only lasts so long. Yeah. When you're left by yourself again in this kind of scenario, by a lake, with melting snow, in a bench, <laughs> and you're alone, <laughs> at the end of the day, what do you really have when that's all gone? Right. You know yeah, what I mean? Totally. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great perspective. And uh, yeah, this was definitely a topic I wanted to bring it up, like the idea of like being a female rapper and like navigating this industry. Uh, and I feel like Sunkissed is like such a great song it's, it's as hard far hard. as, yeah, <laughs> as far as, you know, really uh, outlining how you want to incorporate these ideas you're saying with making really great music, you yeah. know, like and, and, and empowering. I, in empowerment is like such a kind of like a word that can mean more than I intend to. It but can like, also be negated into something yeah that is but not just meant to. in yeah. the in the in the way of just like just somebody listening to this and being like yes i this who i am is exactly who i need to be and it is everything i need to be where i want to be you know absolutely and uh and it also just like a really chill song you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is a great song it was so good to film that because i filmed it with two girlfriends of mine uh, Yasmin and another girlfriend of mine, Daira, yeah. um, both from different backgrounds. Um, and then there's me, but still so like beautiful, you know, just really beautiful people mm-hmm. and like really beautiful women. And we're all different, kind of different age groups. So Daira, she's younger than me. Yasmin, she's older than me. Um, I think by, I don't know how many years, but a couple of years. Uh, so there's definitely that age gap but it doesn't mean that we can't be in the same space Mm -hmm. you know and just kind of embrace this song that was created in a format that represents women in a positive light without it being something that's already been done before you know Mm -hmm. like the the bad bee 
has already been done before yeah. Yeah. you know what i mean like the twerking it's been done before yeah. you know like it's just it's all so redundant that when i think of like women or i think of like just people i just see people yeah you know like i just see like you have really beautiful hair and you have really beautiful eyes and like if there is a god up there well goddamn, they made you beautiful just the way you are right. you know and like in order to describe that beauty we don't have to use these words that we've given these like positive connotations to right, you know right. like um couple years ago bad bitch would have never been a good thing right <laughs> you know what i mean no totally yeah. it would have never been a good thing yeah you, know, you would get pressed you know it mm -hmm. would be a whole different like vibe the approach would be like who are you calling a bitch you right. know what i mean yeah, yeah. and now it's kind of been created to be a word that just kind of means something positive but at the same time it's not positive depending on like the tone yeah, yeah. The context behind this so, it's very layered right yeah. which is troubling in a sense though because then we have like you, like i mentioned i have siblings i also have uh sisters from my father's side from mm -hmm. and they're younger so i have sisters and then i have you know other people around me that are like 10 12 that is like i follow them on instagram you know because they're you know my siblings and then you know these are people that i know or i'll just see them you know and they're like 12 posing like it's your girl the bad b like, oh my I'm god just like, yeah I, and then i'm you know there's that part of me that is like wow you know i guess in a way it could be it it's considered a positive thing right because we're trying to move in a direction where these words mean something positive but at the same time it's like the original context of that word still is you know what i mean so it's yeah. like you don't really know where that falls between but you just kind of want to i don't know you just kind of want to take it steady pace and like try to do my best at least to yeah. represent me as a person in the way that i see things you know like for me i just i don't I don't really rock with that lingo, you know, and so I don't really rock with a lot of the things that the industry right now is feeding, especially yeah. on a female uh, spectrum. I don't like that's just not my vibe. I yeah. just yeah. don't really listen to it. Um, it's it, kind of yeah. sorry. No, I'm interrupting you. I <laughs> no, apologize. It's okay. I, I was going to say, like, sometimes it just feels like really draining yeah. Yeah. to listen to all of that. Like, you know, I'll be driving. Because I just recently got a car. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll be driving and I'll turn on the radio because I don't want to, like, you know, put it in the aux cord. Right. And I'll hear stuff. You know, I'm not going to name any names because at the end of the day, I still think that they're great artists. Right. You know, it's just not my artist. Yeah. You know, it's just not my cup of tea. Yeah. Um, but it's cool, you know, to listen yeah. to and it's cool to, like, vibe to and you do your thing. Like you mentioned, you do your thing, no hate, but that's sure. just not me. Um, but I'll be on my car and I'll be driving and I hear it and... I just have to turn it off because it's so draining and it's just the same thing over yeah. and over and over again. Yeah. Just different people. And at the same time, even though they're different people, sometimes they don't even sound like different people. Right. Yeah. right. And I just, I don't know. I just don't, sometimes I feel like I'm being like screamed at, yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. through, through the music, yeah. it just feels like a little too, like it just feels too much for yeah. me. I don't know, like call me old school, but for me, it just feels too <laughs> aggressive in yeah. the in the form of like bad b bad b bad yeah, yeah. b all and then like you're just kind of trying to instill this thought process into my head and it's like no that's not what i want to be yeah. don't call me that yeah. you know yeah. i think that you're right like in trying to instill the thought process i think a lot of people do actually resonate with that and then a lot of people are just like it's being like thrown on you over and over and over and so you're just like i guess this is what i like and you kind of like forget how to like get in touch with what you actually like right. and what like actually gives you like true energy so i think it's amazing that you've like recognized that that's like not where you're at and you're like finding it's also just like more interesting i mean yeah and again like i'm not meaning to like be critical of people that are doing it that way but i think it it create creating something new that is like truly makes you feel good yeah. 
that'll resonate with people that like aren't able to get that from what's on the radio these days yeah. i hope so you know I, I do hope that in the long run in terms of just the amount of people i just hope that it does end up rec- you know just um being recognized by more people yeah. you know because right now i I'd, I'd like to say i'm pretty stable you know like in terms of where i'm at musically like i feel good but i never feel like 100 percent content you know and i always feel like I can always reach more people and have more people listen, but it, it does make it hard when you don't fall within that same, I don't know if it's a trend, like I don't really know how to label it as of now, but it does make it harder to get people to listen. Yeah, yeah. You know, because not only do they want to listen, they they want to see, you know? Yeah. And it's like, what? well, what do you want to see, you know? like you're here to see what I'm giving you. Yeah. Because like I mentioned, when I put out something, I'm putting it out with purpose Mm -hmm. and I'm putting it out on purpose. So if there's something I typed out or if there's a picture that I use or there's a font that I use, like everything is done on purpose. Yeah. And so what you see is what you're going to get. And I'm just hoping that people will start to recognize that. I mean, I know that there's a market for it. Yeah. Um, I just... I know that there's to get to that market is going to be a long road because now there are these instilled ideals and this kind of, um, I guess, almost popularity with what's out now that it's kind of like drilling through um, concrete, you know, trying to get through to an industry that's basically has been set in stone by the industry now, you know, the industry now looks the way that it looks like and so here comes me <laughs> little <laughs> Miss Mar, you know yeah. um trying to kind of like make my way in but people are kind of like not feeling it but yeah. they're feeling it but not a hundred and it's like yeah. we'll see yeah we'll get there yeah. i'm hopeful i know it will mm-hmm. you know yeah. it'll get there it's just gonna take a little time yeah, yeah i mean with the the bad bitch aesthetic if you want to call it that i mean there's your like personal response to it and then there's your professional response to it and like yeah that's just a lot to have to handle i could understand why you would want to turn it off that's what i was trying to like i wanted to say earlier where it's like yeah like it it must be frustrating to be like this is what i'm hearing and like should i conform to this if i do i want to cheat you know do i want to take the short step you know Um, which i can right right, if i wanted to all i gotta do is change a little bit of words right you know it's not too hard really um and I, you know, change the aesthetic of like the things that I put out. It really isn't that hard. Yeah. So the switch isn't hard. It's the Living staying true to yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. And then the, knowing that you can cheat, but you decide not to, that's really the hard part. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, some of those switches are easier to turn in one direction than the other. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to um, pivot from one professional type uh, to the other professional type that you're involved in, the pool table at <laughs> NYC. Yeah. And, you know, they these are, I mean, as far as I can tell, and you, you can talk more about it, but these seem very linked, you know, because fashion and hip hop, like you said, is a culture, you know, and uh, cl- clothing's uh, very much a part of what we're doing with our project too. So it was really awesome to see that that's a component of what you're doing. Uh, tell us uh, like how it started, you know? All right. So, in high school, um, I went to leadership and public services high school downtown, right next to like where the Twin Towers used to be. And uh, I was, like I mentioned, never really like the popular kid or whatever, but I was kind of in between. And like I would talk to people, but at the same time not. So I was very much introverted and extroverted because I'm like very talkative and outgoing, but at the same time, very reserved and kept to myself. Um, So during like my, I think 11th grade, going on to like 12th grade and all that, I started to get picked on a little bit. I ain't saying no names, but you know who you are. (laughs) Um, I would get picked on because I would wear these one pair of skinny jeans that I had because that's all I had. Mm. And um, my mom, she worked a lot and I mean, I don't know if like the idea of just buying me clothes never came up or it was, I guess it was more about like the necessity. We were just trying to get through the day, you know, like food, rent and my brothers and stuff. 
so that was really like the back that was in the back burner you know mm. like clothes like okay you have a pant like that's at least something and that's just kind of how I lived my days but you know in high school when you're kind of building self-esteem and then people are building their own self-esteem um I would get picked on a lot for that mm. and at one point I just remember her mentioning you know my one pair of pants and my shoes or whatever and I had enough like I was just so tired of it I was so tired of her picking on me and like people looking at me or whatever and I'm like bruh I'm not ugly like I'm just broke <laughs> you know what I mean like I'm not ugly and I'm not like my my style is fly trust me right. I just don't have the money to afford it so I kind of got myself into some trouble not gonna lie I've moved on from that um but the trouble was just that this one time I had an incident that um I got caught stealing mm. and it was clothes I was stealing clothes which is silly you know I think of it now and it's like it wasn't it wasn't that serious you know um had I been me now talking to me then I would have been like hey Mar things are gonna get better <laughs> yeah. chill <laughs> you yeah. know like um that's there are other things in life that you can focus on rather than allowing this person to get into your head to right. this point but at the same time it wasn't even because of her you know like it was just me too like I also wanted to like dress different yeah. mind you this is high school you know I wanted to explore my possibilities and my range and like who am I and clothes says yeah. so much about who you are and like yeah. what you're feeling and the colors you decide to wear and like what you put together and prints and patterns um so after I had gotten in trouble at that time I didn't want to stop finding clothes right. you know I wanted to still like shop and keep my wardrobe going and so that's when I started thrifting cool I started thrifting at a thrift store out in the city because you know I was going to high school in the city yeah so I would tr I would just kind of walk around and travel all over and I'd run into these little like mom and pop shops mm -hmm. um different like chains thrift stores and I would just go inside of them and I would you know buy a couple pieces here and there and I started to build my wardrobe so it really just started through thrifting um but I was thrifting for a very long time I was thrifting for like three four years before I decided that like I could maybe do something with it but that wasn't even really a thought in my head yet I was just thrifting and then I started to go to this other store um when I was in college and I oh this is a whole story behind it. So this is okay so there's a story behind the fact that I met his parents before knowing that they were his parents. Your your partner. Yeah. Oh wow. Brian. Brian. Yeah. And like it was at a store. What? And like they were basically giving me food and like treating they were so nice to me. Yeah. And like they loved me. Was yeah. it their store? No, no, oh, it they was were just, just a store. Yeah, also. it was just a store that we would run into. Hello there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was just a store that we would run into each other and because I would go so often, um, you know, they started to bring me snacks here oh. and there until one time, you know, they pulled out their phone. The mom pulled out the phone and was like, "Hey, like this is my daughter." Oh, that's nice. This is my son. Oh, that's nice. And then she pulls out her phone again another time. And I'm like, oh, this is my other son. And come to find out it's Brian. Yeah. Wow. Mind you, this is during one of those times that him and I had dated. Okay. Well, I dated him. Yeah. <laughs> and so I didn't make much of it. You know, I had one decision to make. Two decisions to make. Either tell her, oh, shit. I know your son or just keep it moving. Yeah. What did you do? I kept it moving. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just kept it moving um, because, you know, again, I didn't have any want to like rekindle relationships with people. And that yeah. was just very much me at the time. Just dead, dead, dead people that right. I felt like they were coming in between me and like my growth. Yeah. Um, so I was just like, eh, I don't got time for that. <laughs> so eventually, um, it's so funny. He hits me up for an interview. So he would, cause he does um, photography. Yeah. And at the time he was doing like this 
video interview about like happiness and I guess he thought that I would be a good candidate <laughs> and so he reached out and it took me like a week to get back to him just because I wasn't sure if I wanted to rekindle this relationship friendship you mm -hmm. know because we were never like dating at the time we were right. just friends but yeah. we would kind of mess around here and there yeah yeah and so I was like eh, I don't know so I took a week to answer and I remember thinking about it very professionally I was like this could be a really good thing for Miss Mar right like <laughs> <laughs> people will get to know Miss Mar a little bit more and it'll be a great thing so I got back to him decided that um you know we'll do it and after that, we became friends again officially. Yeah. Um, and then we started thrifting together. Yeah. And come to find out that uh, his parents would go to like certain markets and stuff like that in uh, all around the city. Yeah. And we started going to them too, like to visit, to look around. And I was already going to markets by myself. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like Chelsea Market and just like a whole bunch of flea markets I'd yeah. go to by myself, you know, because yeah. I'd be roaming around anyway. So then we started going together. And one, was it a summer or a winter? I think it was a summer that we decided like, hey, like maybe we should just like sell some stuff, you know, yeah. like I have a lot of stuff. Like it was, at first it started off just some things that I had collected over the years. Right. And then some stuff that he had collected over the years. And after a while, you know, the things that you have they go so mm. then it's like what do you have left yeah and we liked it we yeah. really we liked doing it and you know we were thrifting anyways and we were finding stuff anyways so yeah. like why not pick it up and you know sell them yeah uh so we started going to the markets more frequently but as sellers we weren't we weren't much <laughs> like we weren't doing so well i think about it now and like we were doing so well to start off with like we weren't making a lot a lot of money mm -hmm. yeah but we were making money that made us want to come back and right. it was just right. fun to be there with him yeah. yeah and i think he would he better say the same <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know we both had a really good time going so we just kept going and going and at one point we started to do signs because there were days that, you know, we didn't have the best days. So we would have like a little dollar bin uh -huh. and we would put things that we just felt like were there for too long and, you know, have people buy them at a dollar so they could just go fast. Yeah. And we would make little signs on like neon signs and cardboard. And uh, eventually we started to get better stuff, yeah. you know, which meant that we would amp up our prices a little but not a lot you know just enough and uh i remember this one customer coming up to us and be like you guys have some really cool stuff and i'm like yeah we do yeah we <laughs> do we do have cool stuff yeah it's just a bunch of little epiphanies in yeah. my life that yeah. kind of lead to the things that are set in stone now um so i remember her saying that we have the coolest stuff and i was like yeah like we do have cool stuff and in the market that we were at, I say this very proudly, humbly, but proudly, we, I think, were always the coolest, yeah. you know? And the thing is that we had our stuff on a table, you know? Mm. And every other vendor also had stuff on tables and racks and things like that. So just like, we're the coolest table in yeah. here. Yeah. Is that how you got the name? We're the coolest space here. Yeah. 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 Um, so I made a little sign on a neon paper pink neon paper that says we are the cool table oh. and the cool part the both of the o's had little eyes like this and the little <laughs> eyelashes fluttering and then under the two o's i had a little smiley face Cute. and then table and you know people just started to kind of recognize that you know like oh look they're the cool table and they would take pictures of it and they would laugh haha -ha. and then they would come to our table and actually look through stuff and be like oh you guys do have pretty cool stuff yeah <laughs> um so we just kind of kept that sign there you know it was just a really it wasn't a crazy sign it was just you know handwritten sharpie marker and we just kind of left it there each time we would go to the market and um as we started to get more merch and people started to recognize us a little bit more, we decided that like maybe we should create a logo, you know, mm. of some sort that'll recognize us. And that's what came about with 
the little logo that we have. I don't know if you guys I've seen have it. And it's, it's two folks it at remind, the I mean, when you're saying you had all these drawn signs, yeah, it was, I mean, I guess that's that was the idea too. It, like keep it, keep it just as like us as possible. Yeah, you know? and that was part of it. So we drew it out of uh, stick figures and we just scanned it onto the computer. Yeah, and that was that. You know, he has. Um, a little blue hat, which he says looks like a beret, but I tried to make it look like a cat. Like a yeah, yeah, right, yeah. it does. To the side, because he used to wear it to the side all the time in the uh -huh. summer. Uh -huh. So we just did it like that. Blue, because it, it would just pop out. He would always wear his Yankee hat, too. Um, and then, you know, me with my little brown hair. <laughs> and that was that. So we created that as the logo. And that's kind of just been where it went from. I mean, we went from going to those markets to going to a little bit more upscale markets mm -hmm. yeah. and started making a lot more like serious money. Yeah. And we decided that like, okay, this is something we could take up a big, big notch and actually like make it what we do for a living. Yeah. yeah. And so that was more so last year. Yeah. Where I think we took it serious to an extent where when quarantine happened mm -hmm. <laughs> when quarantine happens we decided that we needed a website yeah opened up a website that was pretty um i'd say relatively successful i don't want to say and like toot my own horn and be like yeah it was very successful because that'd be kind of a lie you know it was really hard yeah, yeah. um to have that transition from in person to website yeah because we were so used to doing markets right, right. You have know? you been able to do any markets since COVID? Um, so since COVID, we did. Um, right after we got out of quarantine, uh -huh. we did in the summer Okay. Yeah. in Brooklyn. That was incredible. So good. So yeah. lovely and such a memorable experience. We made a really good amount of money. I mean, part of it is what helped me get my car. Oh, you know? amazing. So, you know, just being able to do that. We met a lot of great people. Um, but it was short lived. Yeah. yeah. Because of everything. Yeah. So. Do you think um, post COVID, which hopefully we're coming close to, do you think you'll mostly go back to doing in person markets? And then you also have the website. Like, will you keep that running too? Uh, we're going to, well, we're going to try to do both, right? Yeah. Um, website, I think, is just always going to stay up. Yeah. For the people that, when they go to markets that aren't necessarily from New York, uh, you know because there's a lot of people that do go to these like really known markets just because they're new york right. markets, you yeah. know and so a lot of people these are people that we're never going to see again so if they want to keep shopping with us you know they at least have an alternative the thing with the website is that it's not necessarily all of our inventory i'd say it's like one fourth of the inventory yeah, yeah. So it's a very small fraction because we still want to keep it in person so right. we still want people to want to come see us in person because i just feel like that's what keeps it authentic and yeah. that's what keeps i don't know it's just that new york vibe that grittiness the yeah. true authentic market experience yeah. thing you know like when i do something i want to do it with purpose right yeah and so with the cool table that is part of the purpose of the cool table you know it's that the slogan is why fit in when you can stand out? Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that slogan in itself here, I have the little, it helps me to talk with it. Cause it's like a little prop. Yeah. Hold on. Oh my gosh. Yes, it's so cute. <laughs> so this is the little um, business card that we created. So that's another thing that helped us kind of bring things up a notch just having this you know just yeah. made it feel so official here you can have yeah, it. i feel Thank like you. yeah that even just what you just did that act of like giving someone your card yes feels so nice and when people i mean did you did you have people before you had the card did you have people ask like oh do you have a card yeah and then you have to say like oh no i don't but like I can write it on this receipt. We didn't or like, even you know, have, well, like, <laughs> that's the thing, right? We didn't even yeah. have like, you're welcome. We didn't even have an, like an Instagram yet because right. we were just based in person and we wanted to keep it that way. Right. Um, so for us, it was just kind of like, no, but come back next week, right. you know, yeah. and right. we'll be here. And we just tell people our names and they would remember us. Right. Yeah. Um, but as I was saying before, it's like everything that we do, or at least 
I try to do too, you know, like even in music, it's just keep it original and just kind of do something that feels special. So like, as I was telling you on the slogan here, yeah, which is why fit in when you can stand out. It's kind of that play on just the ideal like school scenario mm. where you have like the jocks and then the nerds and then the you know like the little weird mathematicians and then the fashion girls you know <laughs> like why be all of that when you could chill at our table yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> or you could be all of that or you could be none of that and yeah. still feel really good yeah. mm. and it just kind of stemmed too from a place where like i was struggling a lot in like high school with just finding myself and my style and all the things that I wanted to represent physically and like the things that I wanted to exude to the people around me. Um, and so through the cool table, I wanted to create something that when people came to us, they would feel good in, you yeah. know? And Brian too, you know, when he's scouting out the stuff that, you know, we're looking for, we're looking for pieces that are gonna make people feel like wow this is dope like yeah. this is yeah. so cool like where'd you get this bro i got it from the cool table <laughs> yeah. like yeah. you know like yeah. just something so original and authentic that speaks to so many different personalities that that's really where the cool table stems from we're yeah. just trying to get to people that just maybe don't necessarily have it mind you we range from different price ranges we can get fairly inexpensive to really expensive really quick yeah. sure um it just depends what you're looking for yeah um we mainly focus on t-shirts yep so different graphic t-shirts anywhere from like 70s until like now you know yeah. we'll have certain pieces that are like 2019 2020 those are usually the pieces that go for less mm. yeah. but like the vintage vintage pieces those are the more sure. expensive ones um but again it just kind of fits into everyone's different range yeah of what they're looking for yeah. but that means that anybody can it's like accessible to everyone and there's something for everyone yeah you, everybody can be cool absolutely yeah. and the great thing about it too is that like one thing i think that vintage has become <laughs> is kind of just trendy right mm -hmm. like that's another thing that's just kind of trending now yeah. is yeah. just thrifting which is a great thing in a way like just to have vintage wardrobe because it's Good for the environment yeah. economically it's good for your pockets um <laughs> but in terms of just like having access because so many people are doing it mm -hmm. i think it also limits access to people who need it it's true right yeah. and so when we're thinking about the prices that we are doing and the pieces that we're picking out we're not just thinking trendy we're thinking everyone, you know, like yeah. my mom, yeah. my dad, the aunts, the uncles, you know, the people that send clothes to their family in DR, right. stuff like that. Um, so we often get customers too that are like 40, 50, mm. you know, and like Hispanic moms or like Haitian moms, Haitian dads, you know, like all different, all different kinds of people um, that we cater to. And it's like, sure you can you know you could have a t-shirt too you know Perfect. or you can yeah. i don't know have some sort of like designer piece for yourself treat yourself but you're not paying as much you know and i think that they also appreciate it too because you know we're young um i'm 24 he's 26 uh -huh. turns 27 in march so you know it's we're usually always the youngest ones doing it yeah. <laughs> in the market right. or in person or whatever so that I think adds to the originality yeah. not on purpose really no. but it just happens to be yeah. i bet people are really excited to support these like two young entrepreneurs that are doing oh, yeah. something really cool and it's like benefiting them they get the whole store and it's like yeah i bet it, it's even cooler like when someone's like where'd you get that shirt and you're like i got it from the cool table these like two really cool young people got like it's the, it's <laughs> like the, the best whole feeling. story is it's amazing. the best feeling when we have a customer bring back their friends yeah and then they're wearing the shirt that they bought yeah. oh my like, gosh that is so, so amazing good it's yeah. so good yeah um but you know besides the online and the markets we've also been doing another form of online which is instagram lives oh okay so there's these things that are like virtual flea markets and people go on live on instagram on like pretty well-known vintage accounts 
and they basically auction off certain pieces mm. these are usually more like high-end priced pieces so like our 80s 90s pieces that some the average individual would be like why are you paying this much for a t-shirt but then <laughs> it's the like person, a collector thing or something right. right so that's another market that we're kind of feeding into trying to find that niche within within that subgenre of vintage because yeah. i feel like there's different different forms of vintage and different uh people that want to be catered to differently you yeah. know there's the vintage um pinup or there's the vintage street style right uh, so there's a market for everything i'd say so that's another thing we've been doing we actually have a live on tomorrow yeah oh. we have a live tomorrow it's our <laughs> second oh, time yeah it's our second time going live on instagram so that's something that we're trying to make a thing yeah and maybe eventually branch out and do it on our own personal instagram yeah uh right now we're not doing it on our personal yet because i think that we want to get it, gain a little bit more momentum and you know just followers and yeah. stuff. Yeah, make it uh, worth it. Right, make it worthwhile and the time and the effort because you still have to set up, you know, mm -hmm. in the yeah. form that you would for like a market or whatever. Uh, but that's what we've been doing. The online markets kind of on hold, hoping to do one on April though. Yeah, there yeah. will be more info once it's set in stone. But hopefully, if Things are a little bit more chill by then we'll be back at it in yeah. april that's well, exciting yeah, yeah. i recommend anybody that's watching this check out their website yeah uh, we'll put a until link the market too. comes out because uh yeah i mean i think one of the great things about it is it's so well curated like you know you. if you're gonna if you're gonna go on if you don't like the stuff well then that's not your taste but right, if you course. do like it there's gonna be a lot that you like on that yeah, site yeah absolutely and i think that's good so why don't I, uh we're gonna put it up but what's the what's the link or what's the cool table dot and or what is so it? the website <laughs> is www.thecooltablenyc.com yeah the instagram is the cool table nyc that is t-h-e-c-o-o-l-t-a-b-l-e-n-y-c and um yeah that's for that's the plug for the cool table. Nice. amazing and and then, uh, let's plug the music too while yeah we're here. yeah let's do plug shameless plug no, no, they're, not shame, they're not shameless <laughs> if i'm asking that's true. <laughs> that's true. um so you can find my music on uh, soundcloud which is miss mar rises and on youtube which is also miss mar rises that is m-i-s-s-m-a-r-r-i-s-e-s uh, you can also find me on Spotify, Tidal, TikTok, hey, whatever those cool kids are doing <laughs> on, on TikTok. Um, also, as Miss Mar Rises, same thing as mentioned before. Um, my Instagram is trippin underscore on Mars, which is T R I P P I N underscore O N M A R Z. And I think that's everything right now, right? regarding my music plug yeah, yeah. yeah that's great well, <laughs> yeah. everybody miss mar is a true badass it is like 12 degrees out and it she is hasn't funny. complained <laughs> once it's this a is, little it's this a little is the best uh the strongest it took the strongest podcast guest to do this with us so absolutely thank you thank you so much it was so much fun You're yeah welcome. this has been really great it has been all right well that does it for this week thanks so much for tuning in and joining us yeah, thanks so much for watching. We hope you liked this as much as we liked having the conversation with Miss Mar. If you did, and if you liked us talking to Miss Mar, you can press that button down below that says like. It helps us out immensely in getting this out to other people on the internet, and it'll help Miss Mar get her word out to other people on said internet as well. If you want to say anything, you can put that in the comments below. You can also hit subscribe. There's a bunch of stuff below that you can click on and it's all cool with us the more you click. So click, 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 please. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Thanks so much for joining us on this journey so far. And we will continue next week, uh, our last week in Queens, if you can believe At it. At all, ever, for the whole project. Yeah. Not ever. We will be back to Queens. We love you, Queens. But, yeah, until, uh, until the project's over, this is our last week, like, fully in Queens. Yeah, if you can believe it. But stay tuned. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>